All right, thank you everyone for tuning in and welcome to another entry in the Hagley History Hangout series, where we talk with historians about recent and upcoming work. Today, I am speaking with Eric S. Hintz. He is a historian with the Lemelson Center for the Study of Invention and Innovation at the Smithsonian Institute's National Museum of American History. Uh, Eric develops exhibitions and public programming, coordinates the center's fellowship and grant programs, and assists in the collection of historically significant artifacts and documents. Uh, Dr. Hintz earned his PhD in the History and Sociology of Science at the University of Pennsylvania. And today we're going to be talking about his recent book, American Independent Inventors in an Era of Corporate R&D. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Hintz, uh, did I leave out anything in the introduction that you'd like to add? No, thank you, Ben, for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here and thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm glad you're here today too. Um, can you outline your book for us uh, broadly? What's it all about? Sure. So um, as it says in the cover, or the title on the cover, it's about American independent inventors in an era of corporate R&D. So I was really interested in this question of uh, kind of what happens to independent inventors. And by that, I mean sort of your classic lone uh, individual inventor. So if you go back to, you know, the mid 19th century and you think about who's doing the inventing, it's uh, these kind of heroic figures like Thomas Edison and Alexander Graham Bell, Samuel Morse. Uh, as you get into the early 20th century, it's the Wright brothers, Tesla, folks like this. And, um, you know, they're sort of held up as these heroes of invention and they kind of stand in as these mythical figures uh, and stand in for American technological ascendance in the late 19th century and during industrialization. Uh, but then uh, right around 1900, um, some of the earliest corporations, including General Electric, AT&T, DuPont, Kodak, um, they develop a new uh, method of invention. So they create the corporate R&D lab. They hire PhD scientists. They have a fully uh, outfitted lab. So now you have multiple scientists working on multiple problems at the same time, uh, kind of under this corporate structure. And uh, one of the things I found is in the 19 teens and the 1920s, there was this buzz in the newspapers uh, and in advertisements and things like this that was kind of saying, OK, well, the corporate R&D lab has supplanted the traditional independent inventor. The independent inventor of the past is now obsolete. And in my research, I kept finding these independent inventors. I just kept finding them. Right. And, and then I thought to myself, well, something's going on here. There's a disconnect between what. I'm reading about in the newspapers and then all these stories I'm finding. And so that really motivated my research. And I, I basically ask and try to answer this question, what was it like to be an individual independent inventor in this era of corporate R&D? So I've kind of set it up as like this David Goliath story. You know, what does it mean to be one of these people uh, in an era when folks think that corporate R&D is running the show? And what initially drew you to study this topic in particular? That's a great question. Um, I got really fortunate. Um, when I was a student at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, I took a research methods class um, uh, with uh, Arthur Demrich. Uh, at the time, he was at uh, what was called the Chemical Heritage Foundation, now the Science History Institute. It's in Philadelphia. And he was an adjunct professor for the University of Pennsylvania. Now it turns out he's actually my boss. He's the director of the Lemelson Center uh, at the Smithsonian. So he's kind of seen this project from end to end. So, you know, go back, it's probably like the year 2004, 2005, something like that. I'm a graduate student and it's a methods class and we would meet down at uh, the Chemical Heritage Foundation. And the, the final project for the semester was, you know, choose an archival collection or some kind of collection from uh, the Chemical Heritage Foundation archives and write a research paper. And so I'm looking around, you know, the collections and I find the papers of this inventor. His name is Samuel Rubin. And Samuel Rubin um, is an electrochemical inventor, and his most famous invention is the little button cell batteries that go in like hearing aids and pacemakers and watches. And then um, he uh, sort of uses that research as the basis to create the more familiar kind of AA, AAA, CD batteries that are known today as Duracell. So he's essentially the inventor of Duracell batteries. So I'm thinking to myself, this is a cool project I'll write about this person. Samuel Rubin. So um, probably halfway through the semester, um, I had an individual meeting with Arthur Demrich, you know, like all the students did, he wanted kind of an update on the research project and how it was going. So I tell him all about Samuel Rubin and, and this inventor. Uh, 
And he goes, huh, that's interesting. This guy sounds like an outlier. This is the era when corporate R&D is ascendant. And I thought all those guys like Ruben were done and you should look into that. And I had no idea. So I'm like this tenderfoot graduate student and I had no idea about the R&D literature or anything like that. And he's like, okay, go read the books by George Weiss on GE and go read uh, Leonard Reich on at and and GE. And here's all the books you need to read and sort of understand the corporate R&D side of it. And, and in your research paper, help us understand how this person, Samuel Rubin is somehow different. And that kind of got me started. So that was way back in 2004 and I don't know, 15, 17 years later, here we are talking about the book. So one thing that uh, struck me in particular with the early section of the book is it seemed like the independent inventor uh, prior to the early 20th century occupied this huge, huge piece of mental real estate in the American imagination. Uh, can you say anything about why? Yeah, that's a great observation. I, I think you're right about that. Um, as I mentioned, um, you know, especially in the 19th century, you know, folks like Thomas Edison, Bell, um, Samuel Morse, uh, Cyrus McCormick, I mean, these were American heroes, you know, for, for much of uh, the fledgling nation's history, right, the US is only 100, 150 years old uh, in the 19th century we always look to Europe, right? Europe was where um, the authors were. This is where the arts were from, right? We, there was, you know, you could argue that the, the United States had kind of an inferiority complex, but by the middle of the 19th century, we had our own heroes, right? So our inventors were arguably the best in the world. And we were um, overtaking Great Britain and France and other countries in Europe as kind of the technological center of the world in industrialization because of our great inventors, Edison, Bell, Morse, uh, and whatnot. And so I would, you know, I would suggest that um, these inventors were held up in the public mind as, uh, you know, sort of stand-ins as figures of American technological ascendance. And it was kind of a convenient shorthand, right? You know, um, if you wanted to talk about industrialization and uh, all the different forces at work in the 19th century, that could get complicated and nuanced, but you could say, oh man, you know, an easier way to say that is like, you know, we've got the best inventors, we've got Edison, we've got Bell, look at how great we are as the United States. So these, I, I would suggest that these inventors, these heroic inventors, of the late 19th century kind of became this convenient shorthand uh, about the mythology of American technological ascendance at the height of 19th century industrialization. So was this, purely a mythology or was there something unique about the American patent system that made it more possible for someone to accrue this sort of, uh, you know, background to, to build themselves up in this way? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question and a great observation. I think there is something unique about the um, American patent system and the conditions for, um, aspiring inventors. So there's a, 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 an economic historian up at Bowdoin College named Zarina Khan. She's written a great book called The Democratization of Invention that gets kind of to the heart of this question. Um, her argument is that um, in Europe, so in the UK and in France and Switzerland and other places, uh, the patent system is kind of set up as this monarchical privilege, right? So, you know, uh, an inventor in the UK goes to the, the king or the queen and says, hey, I'd love, you know, temporary monopoly protection over my invention, and this will allow me to create a business. Uh, so they did this for inventions, but they also did this for things like, you know, the East India Company tea and trade and things like that. So it was a kind of privileged thing to have a patent. Um, and in the US, it's, it's the opposite. Uh, Khan argues that, you know, it's a, a, essentially a bureaucracy, right? Anyone can get a patent. It's sort of transparent. Uh, there is a, um, it's not about who you know or your connections. It's like, you know, you send in the specification and if it's um, judged to be uh, unique and, uh, uh, and new, uh, then you can be granted a patent. Anyone can be granted a patent. And in fact, one of the things that's so interesting that, that Khan describes in her work and that I talk a little bit about in the book is that it's the patent system is among the more uh, small d democratic uh, institutions in the United States. So, you know, before 1920, before women can vote in the United States, they can get a patent. Uh, 
uh, enslaved blacks were not able to receive the patents, but freed blacks were. And this is at a time when they had almost, you know, very limited uh, rights of any kind. Uh, and so the patent system uh, in the United States kind of becomes this means uh, for marginalized groups to gain economic and social mobility. Uh, and it's also a source of pride, right? There's people out there, um, you know, you know, some mechanic in Illinois out in the West gets a patent, you know, uh, and they can say, hey, I got a patent. They may never commercialize it, but it becomes kind of like the source of pride. Uh, you know, I think this, this kind of thing of, about Yankee ingenuity and, and the, the fact that the United States, as we talked about before, was a source of pride and a source of American identity. Um, so I think all those things together, that's kind of a, a, a gumbo mix of answers there. But yeah, I think there's something about the American patent system that drew lots of different kinds of people into it in a way that um, didn't happen in Europe. Yeah, I'm glad you bring up the issue of women and people of color interacting with the patent system, because that was another interesting set of information that I had not really appreciated previously was the idea that you know a woman can get a patent but if she's married she runs into issues selling or, or you know doing anything with it outside of holding it uh the other point that i found uh really interesting was the story of uh trying to read my own handwriting here uh garrett morgan and the sure. gas mask a and that when he was outed as being an african-american that that actually led to a loss of sales for the gas mask, even though nothing changed about it. Right. No, I appreciate that that um, that question. So, um, you know, one of the things I try to um, argue for in the book is, you know, or I asked, I guess I asked the question. So, you know, in the late nineteenth century, you know, inventors were heroes, and we knew who they were: Edison, Bell, Morse. You know, we talked about that. But then in the twentieth century, we don't know who inventors are in the same way. Part of the reason for that is um, the corporate R&D labs go on this kind of PR campaign, and we could talk about that later. But part of it is, uh, as you mentioned, women and African-American inventors, I found, almost work to conceal their own identities. They almost sort of work to obscure themselves. So, you know, you mentioned women. Um, in the 19th century, there were all kinds of married property laws, right? So if you were a woman and you were married, all of your property sort of just rolled up to your husband, right? Um, it was just assumed that the, the husband in that relationship controlled all the property. So let's just assume, you know, a woman inventor earns a patent. Well, that piece of intellectual property would belong to her husband. And so she would have no control over being able to license it, over being able to sell it. Uh, if someone infringed the patent, she would not be able to uh, defend the patent in an infringement lawsuit. So all of the sort of power over the intellectual property, uh, uh, you know, was belonged to the husband uh, in states where you had married property laws. So this dissuaded a lot of women from even trying to become inventors. Or often what happened is there was sort of this dodge, right? So a woman inventor would invent the thing and then they would have the patent taken out in the name of their husband's. Uh, or male relatives, sometimes fathers or brothers or whatnot, or even their male patent attorneys. And so there's a, a whole uh, section I write about, uh, you know, this idea that we may never know how many women inventors there were from the past because of these kinds of self-concealments. And the same thing happened in the African-American community. Um, again, even though um, free Blacks were able to take out patents, uh, many um, African Americans I found uh, purposefully concealed their identities to avoid prejudice at the patent office and especially in the marketplace. And this was precisely what happened with Garrett Morgan. So Garrett Morgan was a Cleveland inventor in the 19 teens, 1920s. Uh, he invents this uh, gas mask. So it's this hood that you put over your head and it's kind of got tubes that go down to the ground uh, that allow you know clean air to be uh, taken in. And so he Garrett Morgan, a black man, hires white actors to portray him, both in his uh, sales literature and uh, there would be these uh, sort of invention fairs and trade shows where you'd go and sell the inventions and he would hire white actors to portray him. Uh, but he kind of gets outed, as you mentioned. There is this um, accident in Cleveland. The Cleveland Water Works had a tunnel that went out into uh, Lake Erie and it drew the water in, uh, but there was an explosion and some of the workers were trapped and it was smoke and all the stuff. So they call up uh, Garrett Morgan and his brother, they put on the gas masks, they go down into the tunnel uh, 
uh, and they're able to uh, rescue a few workers and recover some of the of the dead bodies. Well, it gets a ton of um, uh, public publicity in the newspaper, and there's a photo of a dramatic photo of him rescuing uh, the people, and it's uh, it's uh, shown that he's a black man. And so, um, at the moment of triumph, where he proves uh, the efficacy of his invention. Uh, it's also revealed that he's a black man, and then many fire departments uh, cancel their orders. So it's just this kind of heartbreaking story of uh, while the patent system uh, created an opportunity for someone like Garrett Morgan, a black man that uh, was otherwise marginalized in so society, he, could, he still couldn't escape some of the realities uh, of his status as a black man in the United States. And uh, when his identity was revealed, it actually um, hurt him. And that his identity, you know, he is this independent, you know, part of the hero mold and he gets outed doing something genuinely quite heroic too. It just really almost, I mean, reading about it, it seemed like just add insult to injury. Yeah, it was a, a terrible, heartbreaking story, but it gets to sort of this paradox of, of race. At the moment when he should have been triumphant, it actually hurt his commercialization chances. Uh Something I was interested in as we move more into the 20th century was this sunsetting of individual, I don't know if sunsetting is the appropriate word, but uh, decline or you know, old age steps in as you have some of these heroic inventors like Thomas Edison uh, passing away at the time that R&D labs start to really become a thing. And I thought that was especially interesting because you sort of see Edison doing something that I thought looked very similar to what uh, DuPont was doing at about the same time, just across the creek from us here at Hagley. Yeah, you know, Edison was an interesting uh, figure in all of this research. So, you know, he is the consummate heroic inventor, the first one that we think of when we think of the traditional individual inventor. And yet, Edison is also um, arguably one of the inspirations behind the R&D lab. So if you go to the 1870s, 1880s, I should know this date better. He founds the Menlo Park lab um, in New Jersey, his invention lab. And so he, uh, he's kind of on retainer to Western Union. Uh, so it's corporate from the beginning, right? They fund the lab and they say, hey, you know, you're doing all these great inventions in telegraphy. We'd love to put you on retainer and just you know, have first right of refusal on anything that comes out of your workshop. So he sets up this lab in Menlo Park, hires multiple assistants. Uh, you know, he has multiple experiments going on at the same time. It's kind of this combination of a machine shop and a chemistry lab. There's a library upstairs. Uh, and he's able to move the inventions in Menlo Park uh, rapidly from sort of the workbench and the prototype through commercialization. Uh, and, you know, a couple of huge inventions there, the incandescent light bulb and lighting system, the phonograph, you know, he gets very famous. And so corporations sort of see Menlo Park as an inspiration. And in fact, when um, Edison merges his interests with the Thompson Houston company to form General Electric in 1892, it's only about eight or nine years later that GE forms arguably the first R&D lab in the United States around 1900, and they install uh, an uh, MIT PhD, uh, Willis Whitney in charge, and they're, I would argue, inspired by Menlo Park. So they set up something very similar to that in Schenectady, New York. So back to the earlier part of your question. So then Edison dies, and, you know, it's interesting for... Um, for the boosters of R&D, like how are they going to treat this? And so on one hand, uh, you know, the newspapers say, well, this is sort of the coup de grace for the, the traditional independent inventor. You know, with Edison, the last of the great heroic inventor dies and like now we're on to the era of corporate R&D. And the, the corporate folks also have to be a little careful because they can say things like, oh, he was such a great inspiration for our more superior form of invention, but you know, he could only take it so far now now we're gonna continue the legacy of Edison with our you know, much more sophisticated R&D lab. So there's this um, kind of massaging of the language where they want to, uh, the R&D boosters kind of wanna deprecate and malign Edison to one degree, uh, 
but also uh, acknowledge him as the kind of inspiration for their own uh, mode of invention. I know this goes off the list of questions, but just this discussion of an inventor, a creator who is so uh, tied to his company uh, really just brought me to mind of Steve Jobs and what Apple's direction has been like since his death and all of that. Do you think there's any parallels to be made there? You know, um, Jobs is an interesting um, parallel. Um, you know, I think it was 2011 when he passed away. Um, there was a sort of national outpouring of grief and mourning, you know, the celebration of Jobs, much in the same way as there was with Edison um, when he passed away. Um, and there was, you know, I think there was a sort of recognition in, in, uh, in the culture in 2011 that, you know, we had lost someone really special and that in the same way that Edison sort of stood in for innovation in the late 19th and early 20th century, Jobs stood in uh, for, for innovation kind of from like the mid seventies until he died, right? Like if, if you had asked someone on the street, like, well, who's an innovator? Many people would probably have come up with the name Steve Jobs, which I think would have been parallel to like, if you had asked that question of someone in you know, 1910, they would have said Edison. So yeah, I definitely think um, they both kind of um, represented this kind of top of mind, um, you know, first stand in, you know, who invents, who's an innovator. I think it was Edison uh, in his time and Jobs uh, in our uh, most recent era. So I think that that is a good parallel. I guess this is a great way to get us uh, back on track. If you'd asked someone that question at mid-century, what would they have said? You know, um, this is this is one of the the little devices that I, I use in the book uh, to talk about why you know why we don't know who invented uh, mid twentieth century uh, so much as we did in the heroic era, right? So if you ask someone on the street who's, you know, who invented the phonograph, uh, most would or the electric light bulb, most would be able to come up with Edison. If you'd said, well, who invented Facebook? Uh, most people would probably be able to come up with Zuckerberg. So, you know, if you go back to the 19th century or you look at sort of the more recent 21st century, there's this kind of idea that we kind of know uh, who invent things. But in, this 20, in the 20th century, I would argue we don't know who invents things quite as much. And the example I used is, well, who invented the photocopier? And I'll just ask you, Ben, do you know who invented the photocopier? <sighs> I just read your book and I can't remember. <laughs> <laughs> you're Carlson. Proving, you're, last name is Carlson. Carlson, right? you're right. So you're so you, so you had the benefit of reading my book, but you're sort of illustrating my point, right? Is like, uh, you know, why is it that in the 20th century we don't know who our individual inventors are in the same way that we did in the earlier heroic era? And so then that sort of motivated me, like, well, why is that? How can we don't know that? So Chester Carlson is the answer. And so I spend a lot of time. I spend an entire chapter talking about like. Um, why was there this perception that the independent inventors had sort of disappeared, that corporate R&D was ascendant, when uh, in actuality, you know, inventors like Chester Carlson and Samuel Rubin and others were busy doing their thing, but they just weren't getting as much notoriety as their heroic forefathers. How much of a role do you think uh, PR played in that? Because there was that discussion, I think it was a Oh, was it Dow Chemical with the photo in the research lab with the caption, no genius is here? Just to... <laughs> yeah, so I spend a lot of time um, talking about um, kind of the corporate side of this misperception. So um, one of my key arguments in the book is that corporate R&D, as it's uh, kind of emerging in the early uh, 19-teens, 1920s, 1930s, um, as R&D is, is emerging as a, a new corporate form of invention, uh, corporate PR and advertising is also taking off. So those two corporate um, functions are kind of emerging at the same time. And I argue that, that um, corporations really take advantage of their PR capabilities to kind of boost and trumpet their R&D accomplishments and malign the independent inventors. So corporations, I think, really wanted to justify this new form of invention. So the American public, maybe even their shareholders, uh, the executives on their board might have asked themselves, well, why would you need this big expensive lab? You know, don't we have, isn't America the country of the Edisons and the Bells? Like, can't we just, you know, uh, 
rely on independent inventors. And I think part of the reason corporations uh, really wanted to advertise their R&D capabilities is they wanted to justify the expense and, um, and the investment in it. And uh, so they were very invested in saying things like, you know, we've got the world's, you know, DuPont had all these ads that I found in the collections of Hagley saying things like, you know, we've got the world's largest chemical engineering um, capability. Uh, you know, we have, you know, four chemical laboratories that employ 2000 chemists and, you know, we're big and powerful and that's how we bring you rayon. That's how we bring you Duco car polish. That's how we bring you celluloid film that's in your, the movie that you're watching. And so they're, they're very at pains to sort of show that R&D um, is kind of behind uh, the prowess of the technical prowess of the company and uh, that there's this direct benefit um, to the consumer. At the same time, uh, they're maligning the independent inventors. Um, so where as inventors would say things like, you know, maybe they wouldn't say this about themselves, but the newspapers would say, well, Tesla is a genius and, um, you know, uh, Edison is a genius. The corporate R&D labs took a different posture, which is, look, we don't want to rely on the idiosyncrasies of a genius because that's unpredictable. We're making invention predictable, right? We've got a lab, we've got a process. You can be sure that every few months, a new innovation is going to come out. So they, the corporations kind of wanted to um, downplay this idea of genius and really um, advertise this idea that we have, you know, yes, competent, trained chemists, but we don't need genius. Uh, we can assemble the right team and we can have inventions flow from our corporate R&D labs without, um, you know, having to rely on something as unpredictable as a flash of Eureka genius or something like that. We can sort of um, uh, regularize uh, this process of invention by bringing it inside the corporation. But even then, is it a case of not always? Because while they're maligning independent inventors, there's this relationship ongoing where they are bringing on independent inventors as, uh, and we talked about this a bit before we started the recording, uh, consultants and sort of this newish independent contractor role. That's right. So this was one of the great um, ironies that I found um, in the book. So at the same time that the corporate R&D labs are kind of, you know, taking out print advertisements and, uh, you know, the R&D directors are making speeches, kind of maligning, you know, the independent inventors. Oh, that's the old fashioned way of invention. We've got the newfangled way of invention. So at the same time that they're maligning the independent inventors, they're busy making contracts with them uh, to get access to their inventions. So there's a, a kind of a two-faced nest there to the R&D labs. So, you know, when the R&D labs are first beginning in the 19 teens and the 1920s, they're not able to produce all of the inventions they need in-house. So the corporate R&D labs at places like GE, AT&T, DuPont, Kodak, they spend uh, time uh, paying attention to the technical publications, watching the patents that get published. And so they are surveying the landscape. And if they see that there's an interesting patent that they need uh, in order to build a, a new product or improve a process, they will go out and um, uh, basically make a partnership with an independent inventor. Uh, so that might mean uh, purchasing their patent outright for a flat fee. It might mean um, creating uh, a kind of uh, consulting arrangement where they license, you know, the independent inventor retains uh, ownership of the patent, but the corporation licenses the patent and pays royalties. Um, and I found uh, lots of examples of this. So fr from the Hagley um, archives, uh, there was this independent inventor named Hudson Maxson, and his papers are at Hagley. And he had this consulting arrangement with DuPont. Uh, Hudson Maxson had invented uh, a form of smokeless gunpowder. And of course, you know, DuPont, especially in the teens and 20s, very much about munitions um, and things like that. And so uh, it's interesting. I wasn't able to determine if DuPont had tried to hire um, Maxim, but Maxim was, you know, he was all about his own autonomy. He saw himself as one of these genius independent inventors, even if DuPont had made the offer for him to come work at the R&D lab he probably would have refused it. So what they ended up doing was creating this partnership. They had this consulting arrangement where Maxim was kind of on retainer. 
um, DuPont would license his patents for the gunpowder, and then they would work together to kind of commercialize it, fix you know problems on the factory floor, that kind of thing. So um, I found again and again um, these kinds of uh, contracting or consulting relationships where. Uh, on one hand, the corporate R&D labs through their PR wing are saying, oh, you know, independent inventors are obsolete. And then meanwhile, back at the R&D lab, they're cutting all these contracts and consulting arrangements with people like Hudson Maxim, Samuel Rubin, et cetera. Were there any other interesting finds from the Hagley collection? Yeah, the the uh, the main uh, collections that I, I used were um, these advertising collections. So we talked about how Dupont was, you know, advertising its uh, R and D prowess, and there were these subtle uh, messages kind of maligning the independence in there. Uh, I used the the Hudson Maxim uh, papers extensively. Um, another set of papers that I used were the papers of Elmer Sperry. So he's another uh, independent inventor. Um, Thomas Hughes has written a great book on him back in the seventies. Um, so he was really into like um, gyroscopes, gyro compasses, um, uh, using the rotational energy of gyroscopes to uh, build feedback and control systems. So Sperry does a lot of work in World War I um, uh, with the Navy, uh, using the gyro compass to help uh, stabilize uh, big Navy ships and develop firing systems, gun firing systems. Uh, and he also works on the, what he called the aerial torpedo, what we, what we might call a drone. It was basically like a pilotless, pilotless plane. And so he would use his gyroscope to um, kind of do like an autopilot and you would fly this uh, aerial torpedo at some sort of target. So a uh, lot of work in the Elmer Sperry papers. And then the last place uh, that I spent a lot of time at, at Hagley was in the papers of the National Association of Manufacturers. So massive collection. Um, but what I was really interested in there was uh, the NAM's um, kind of uh, anti-reform efforts. So during, during, the, um, during the New Deal, so this is the late 1930s, um, there was a lot of anti-monopoly sentiment, uh, a lot of uh, understanding that patents were part of how companies like AT&T and GE uh, we're able to monopolize uh, their industries, right? So if you're GE and you have all the patents for how to make a light bulb and all the machines that make the light bulbs, like you've effectively, um, you know, have a monopoly over the industry. So there was an increasing understanding of how patents were uh, part and parcel of uh, some of these monopolies. And of course, the New Deal was about breaking up the monopolies. And um, so there was a lot of uh, congressional investigations into like, you know, what degree do patents contribute to monopolies? And there was uh, an effort in Congress among the New Dealers to kind of weaken the patent laws and to try to um, uh, loosen the grip of some of these uh, patent-based monopolies. But I found that the National Association of Manufacturers uh, lobbied really hard to maintain the patent laws as they were because they were so advantageous to the corporations. Uh, they developed this really interesting um, uh, PR campaign called the Modern Pioneers, where they celebrated all kinds of inventors, not just corporate inventors, but also individual inventors. And the idea was to kind of put the patent system on a pedestal and say, hey, let's celebrate all these inventors. There, there couldn't be anything wrong with a patent system that had produced the Wright brothers and you know, the nylon group at DuPont and, uh, and Edwin Land, the inventor of Polaroid. And so... Uh, I argue that they are successful in kind of blunting uh, patent reform um, through their lobbying efforts. And so that, that all of that uh, kind of information came out through the papers of the National Association of Manufacturers. Is there anything else important about uh, this sort of continual quest that never seems to quite get off the ground for patent reform? <laughs> you know, um, I have a... Um, I have a, a final chapter, um, uh, I guess a penultimate chapter that kind of looks, um, you know, the, the, the main section of the book is focuses on the period from about 1890 to 1950. Uh, but I have kind of like an epilogue chapter that says, well, what happened after 1950 and kind of brings things up to the present. Um, you know, patent law has been kind of this thorn in the side of the independent inventors for a long time. And, um, you know, one of the things that's interesting about the patent laws is so if you own a patent, um, it gives you this monopoly, right? But it's uh, on the owner of the patent to defend it. 
So if corporation, you know, let's say an independent inventor owns a great patent uh, and a big corporation uh, decides to infringe it, you know, it's the, it's the duty of the, the patent holder to, to defend the patent. And you have to, so it, put, it sort of puts these independent inventors in the position of having to sue the big powerful corporations. And the corporations use this as a strategy. I mean, I found over and over again that the big corporations uh, kind of willfully infringed the patents of the independents and essentially dared them to sue them. Uh, because the corporations knew that they had, you know, way more finances, way more lawyers. They could basically just bleed the independents dry with depositions and time and just, you know, basically bankrupt them uh, if they wanted to pursue these kinds of, of litigations. And so, you know, over different times, you know, I, I guess I would argue that whether it was in the you know, middle of the 20th century or even now, there was a series of patent reforms that happened between, say, like 1999 and 2011. And I would argue that, you know, the, the patent laws remain kind of tilted in favor of the corporations. And if you, you know, follow any independent inventors on Twitter or Facebook or anywhere, I mean, they're all, it seems pretty upset about the state of the patent laws. They feel like they're very slanted in, turn, in favor of the corporations. So uh, it, it kind of remains a thorn in the side of the independent inventors. Right. So is this also related to the period that gave us the DMCA? This is the, remind me, this is the digital, the digital millennium copyright act. Yeah. I don't get into, um, copyright as much in the book, so I'm not as familiar with that. So I don't want to say too much about that, but, um, sure. yeah, if, if, if I'm correct though, this is kind of the thing that uh, keeps us from pirating, uh, it kind of like shut down like Napster and things like that. Right. It, it, it sort of Essential. prevented the sharing. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't uh, go into the copyright as much, but it, uh, it's probably of a piece. So to keep us in the modern day, we see this rise again of the independent inventor, or at least these uh, inventors who become stand-ins for their companies. Uh, is that, again, a, a turn of PR, a change in the American imagination? What, what do you think drove that? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. And thanks for that question. So um, in this epilogue uh, chapter where I try to bring things up to the present day, I argue that um, independent inventors kind of have this resurgence. So after years of sort of being denigrated uh, by the corporate R&D labs and sort of being invisible to most people and we don't know who invents anything, uh, you know, in the 70s, we start to hear about people like Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Oh, and there's this guy named Bill Gates and his partner. Um, and, you know, later, if, as you get into the 90s, it's Sergey Brin and Larry Page with Google, and, and you start to sort of hear about um, kind of either individual or paired inventors uh, kind of making waves again. So I kind of locate this back to the 70s. Um, you know, corporate R&D is really ascendant in the immediate uh, post-World War II period, right? They're kind of living off of Cold War contracts, like you imagine IBM making tons of mainframes and like um, doing a lot of business for government agencies and universities. You imagine like Boeing and Lockheed developing all kinds of like military technologies, and um, you know, you know, you've got um, Bell Labs is winning Nobel prizes and like developing lasers and transistors and all this great stuff, and that continues for a while, but then. Um, during the 70s, you, the corporate R&D labs start to slip a bit. So you start to see like, you know, Kodak invents the digital camera. You know, one of their researchers, Steve Sasson, invents the digital camera in like 1975. But they say, oh, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to stick it in a drawer because that would undermine our film business. And then, you know, I don't know, 10, 15 years later, now all of a sudden, you know, Japan has the digital camera, right? It's Sony, it's Canon, it's all these companies. And so, you know, it's kind of like, whoops. Um, you know, RCA for years and years and years was like the lead uh, consumer electronics company in the United States, but they kind of slip, right? They lose out on like the VCR and other things uh, to Sony and other companies. So you, you kind of have these, um, you know, I would argue that uh, US R&D kind of begins to slip uh, in the 70s and early 80s, IBM again, right? They nearly missed the PC, right? They sort of, uh, you know, Apple and other small PC companies sort of get a head start uh, on IBM before IBM comes out with the, its own PC. So um, there kind of becomes this um, 
feeling in the press and, and, and people who study business conditions and innovation that, you know, the big corporate R&D labs have kind of become slow and they're not um, nimble and, you know, they're kind of missing opportunities. And, oh, look over here, we've got these like, you know, rough looking guys in the garage, like Steve Jobs or like these Harvard dropouts, you know, Bill Gates and Paul Allen create Microsoft. And it's like these little ragtag teams of innovators. And yet they're kind of like getting over on the big corporate R&D labs. And so this kind of celebration of the spunky uh, underdog uh, garage inventor uh, kind of becomes a thing, right, in the 1980s. And, and we can, as you mentioned, we celebrate all these folks, whether it's Steve Jobs or, you know, Jeff Bezos, you know, Mark Zuckerberg inventing Facebook in his dorm room. Uh, this kind of becomes the new stand-in for what it means to be an innovator. It's we're back to the kind of plucky individual and the corporate um, lab is kind of seen as slow and not as innovative. Although if you look at the patent numbers, I mean, the IBMs of the world are still cranking out hundreds of patents every year. So it's an interesting kind of turnabout in the late 20th uh, century and the early 21st century. As an outside observer, um, you know, this isn't a subfield I was particularly familiar with. And I guess having only read one book on it, I'm still not. But it seems like since the rise of corporate R&D with the 20th century, it seems that both of these have operated side by side with that differing focus of who gets more uh, space in our collective imagination, more so than who's actually doing the work. That is a terrific observation. Yeah, there's a disconnect between what's actually happening and what we pay attention to, right? So yeah, I think that would be one of the key arguments in my book is that you know we've always had independent inventors. They've always been side by side with the corporate R and D labs, and uh, while at different times, you know, one or the other may get more attention or be celebrated more, uh, they both coexist. And uh, you know, as as I discussed um, with the the kind of the contractor and consulting re relationships, it's the symbiotic relationship. You know, independent inventors often survive on the consulting contracts and royalties they get with their partnerships from the uh, the corporate R and D labs. The corporate R and D labs can invent a lot of stuff within their own walls, but they often have to go outside to get you know this piece or that that they need in order to assemble uh, a particular technology. And so, you know, I would argue that it remains a symbiotic relationship that. Um, that both the corporate R&D lab and independent inventors remain super central to the overall um, kind of ecosystem of innovation in the United States. Are there any other takeaways that you'd like readers to come away with? Um, no, I just, I'm, I'm flattered that you've had me here to talk about the book. I hope, uh, you know, if, if you're an inventor yourself or someone who's interested in questions of, you know, um, innovation, how things come to market, um, you know, check out the book. I hope you'll learn some things. I certainly did along the way. Um, um, maybe one thing um, I would also suggest is we, we talked a little bit about this with Sperry is, um, you know, I have a lot of stuff um, in the book about how independent inventors um, really contributed to World War I and World War II. A lot of patriotic uh, contributions. The United States government kind of calls on uh, inventors to submit their suggestions to the federal government during times of war. And I, I talk about some of these crowdsourcing efforts, uh, both in World War I and World War II. So um, yeah, I, I, I'm just pleased that we were able to have this conversation. I hope people will check out the book. And uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm super proud of it and glad that it's, it's come out. It it's, was a long journey putting the thing together. So it's, it's great to see these ideas between two covers. And thank you again for sitting down with us for this entry of Hagley History Hangout, which uh, you'll be able to find on YouTube and our social media channels. And if you'd like to hear more about the book, and I imagine get into that conversation about World War I and World War II at greater depth, uh, Dr. Hins will be at Hagley in December for an author talk. So uh, again, once again, on that note, thank you for sitting down with me today. Ben, thank you so much for having me. It was real fun. I appreciate it. And we'll see you in December. Thank you.